P2S packs heat, punches through the plate, Bamboo breaks silence on blazing A1 blunder, and Furious Fabrication forces a fiery nozzle fling. All this and more, Print Fix Friday, episode 226. Now we got an answer. It only took us like six months in getting on the news about it. Let's get into it. Starting off with one that came across our desk about a week ago, actually, and I didn't want it to muddy the waters, everything else that was going on, but a unique reason for me to be afraid of things. Here we got a P2S from Bamboo where the actual heater coil has melted through the effing plate on the bottom side. It's plastic. This is where, once again, we are lucky that Bamboo does spring for that extra couple of pennies to get the fire retardant plastic because this would have been bad. Bamboo has actually replied where they're saying their team looked into it and found the issue was caused by the loosening of the internal heating tube on the heat bed. They sent a reply to their support ticket with the technical details and solution. I don't know about you, but I don't want a case where this is possible. And those of you that are, what about the other brands? Yeah, Prusa actually had a huge issue with this, but it was kind of the other way around. It was the connections for the Mark III, Mark IV, Mark IVs heat beds. They were notorious because these were bed slingers for coming loose if you didn't tighten them properly and if you didn't assemble them properly you would end up with too much resistance things start to get a little bit warm and you would end up melting connectors that's somewhat on prusa but i think that's more on the person that assembles it if it is a factory assembled machine and that happens that one's on prusa this is a factory assembled machine because bamboo doesn't do kits and especially not in this area this should not happen now i am at this point more than willing to call this a fluke we are not following this this is the only issue that we've seen with the p2s so no need to worry but if there is a way to check if the heater is tight i recommend you guys go and take a look at it these machines any modern machines move at mock jesus that speed creates problems things come apart machines like this can vibrate loose and you can run into problems it is why we highly recommend especially with these faster machines every 500 750 hours just stop drop shut them down we recommend that you stop and take a look at the machine. Verify that connections are tight. Make sure everything is retorqued down. Go ahead and re-lubricate things if you haven't in a while. Uh, clean off your Z-axis, re-lubricate it. Things like that. On any machine, Bamboo, Prusa, Creality, any cubic, don't care. If they're running fast, they are more susceptible to things breaking, especially when it comes to electrical components. And well, let's be honest here. These machines get the hell kicked out of them during shipping. Should this happen? No. Thankfully, as far as we can tell, this is an isolated incident. So no need to really worry, but if you can check it, hey, might as well do it. I'd love to know from you guys though, what are your thoughts here? Is this on Bamboo? Is this on the shipping company? Is this on the user? Where, where are we applying some of our extra inspection here where are we doing it hey while you're down there don't forget to leave a like my name is grant this is 3d musketeers and print fix friday where we help you get your prints back to printing with purpose and if you have issues and you would like us to solve them for you you can reach out to us via all the social medias or our favorite option is to film a video and tag us on it on youtube and we'll get notified of it but following up on the bamboo stuff that we've had recently right you guys know that we have been kind of going down the path of the bamboo a1 ntc thermistor failures and uh yeah apparently that got the attention of all 3dp and a couple of other news publications that they got an answer out of bamboo something that we have had nothing of in the months that this has been going on the answer from bamboo well it's an interesting one the power circuit design and surrounding plastic materials comply with applicable safety standards and use flame retardant materials. While a damaged NTC may generate sufficient heat to deform or melt adjacent plastic, it does not lead to ignition or sustained combustion. As a result, the risk of fire is considered extremely low. There have been no reported cases of fire associated with the issue. I don't disagree that the fire retardant plastic is, thank God, doing its job, but 
But Bamboo goes on saying that although the problem affected a very small number of devices and occurred only under very specific conditions, we made the necessary changes nonetheless. The issue from a technical standpoint was resolved in Q3 of 2025. I'm not exactly certain that's accurate. I guess it depends on where the machine came from and when it was actually produced. So the way that Bamboos fixed this, hilariously, is just to replace the NTC thermistor with a bridge wire. In fact, a lot of you saw that in the Bamboo episode. We'll, we'll card to it if you want to take a look. We even mentioned it, that that's the fix, that the fix is just to remove it. But Bamboo is blaming power surges, and I'm not certain that I 100% follow this. Bamboo has stated in previous articles that they believe it's lightning or power surge related, but I don't think that's the issue. And talking with an electrical engineer, he doesn't really think it's the issue either. We've got some other theories that we're working on, but Bamboo's claim of a power surge might not be wrong, but we don't think that the issue is lightning. We are seeing these failures from all over the world, and mind you, it is solely on the A1 and P1S, so stop asking if it's on the A1 Mini 2. It's not. We have no issues with the A1 Mini currently. We've got like all these different things we're testing, things like resistance on the beds, inductance on the beds, resistance on the power supply, inductance on the power supply. And why we see more of the A1 failures and the P1S failures is that on the A1, this AC board controls both the AC and the DC side, where on the P1S, it is only the AC side. Even though the DC side is something around 240 watts max, it's enough to piss this off. And while, yes, so far we haven't seen a fire, Bamboo didn't say it was zero. I would still recommend taking care of your machines, putting them on concrete. It's going to quiet them up anyways. The concrete's a win-win as far as I'm concerned. But if you do have an A1 that you bought prior to I would even say late Q4 of 2025, and you are not comfortable with your machine, in theory, having the NTC, please reach out to Bamboo. It appears that at this point, they are at least starting to take care of it. But I do believe, even though we are not at, as they claim, the 0.1% that triggered a recall, their claim is 0.052%, a very specific amount, which if we use my numbers, put us at over 135,000 machines out in the field. But if I was trying to click farm, which we're not, the title of this video would say, a bamboo A1 has burned every single day this year. We've seen a growth of more than 10% to the list in just 2026 alone. As both of the articles out there state, the publicity is obviously helping something. So all this to say, we have something moving in a direction. Let's hope it's the right direction, but I'm glad that Bamboo is finally owning up to this semi-publicly and taking care of it. This is what we wanted in the first place, period. We want your machines to be safe. This is what we want. Moving over to one that I thought got me until I just reloaded the page and realized I was right and the person updated their post so I have I have removed it so you can't read it currently. Um, TLDR X1C with 2200 hours is failing a large print with progressive under extrusion leading to slight spaghetti and or air printing. Replaced hot end, hot end fan, entire extruder assembly, filament runout sensor, PTF tubing, and even the freaking SD card. Filament confirmed good on another machine, ruled out slicer and print settings, glasses removed on the top, nicely ventilated, no idea what to check next. Brother, you're you're going through all the right steps. Let's 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 take a look at some of these videos here. Print's looking pretty good. Pretty good. A little rough. Really rough. Really rough. And then dead fail. The other one we can see similar, right? Looks okay, and then all of a sudden it doesn't look okay. We can see the issue, their data. I mean, this is what we want to see for Print Fix Friday submission. And until the user had actually like posted it in there, we can see that people are saying, did you replace the hot end fan? It could be underperforming and leading to heat creep. I'm looking at this saying this is textbook heat creep, but they've replaced the cooling fan. So if they've replaced the cooling fan for the hot end, it's probably not the hot end cooling fan. And we can see it wasn't actually on. I think I can safely say I'm getting off this troubleshooting roller coaster. I returned to write this message. Yep, 
that was it. The old fan was dead, the new fan was faulty and dying, and they never stayed long enough to watch it. It was heat creep. When this was posted in our Discord, I said it looks like heat creep to me, but the user said it wasn't, so I said I'm baffled on it. But it is actually heat creep because their hot and cooling fans were broken, both of them. And statistically speaking, that's not gonna happen. But it was just dead enough that it would die midway through the print. So I don't know, what do you guys think about this? Let me know down in those comments. Moving on to Hartley Printing. Uh, a lot of you might know him from his short form content. He does a lot of 3D printing on a massive Prusa farm up in the Great White North of Canada. He's very open and public about what he does and how he does it and some of his dollar figures. It's cool, it's inspiring, and we hope to be doing something similar to this in the new year, so keep an eye out for it. But we can see here that his printer started printing quite well, and then all of a sudden, the front of the friggin' nozzle popped off. It's something we talked about before. In fact, it happened to me, and it's happened to a few of you as well, where the tip of your nozzle pushes out. This is a fun problem that we don't really have a good solution to. I mean, there are ways of fixing it before it happens, but it needs to be done from the manufacturer side of things. This is a high flow nozzle. High flow nozzle, bit of a problem in that they're just pushed in. The CHT design where it splits the filament up to increase the surface area that is heated, and then it comes back down to the point of the nozzle where all those three to four lines of filament are rejoined. If you have excess pressure, over time, you can actually force the tip of that nozzle out. Now, ways around this are staking it in, um, doing a, a punch or something like that to really keep it from coming out. And I think that manufacturers should look at doing that, but it would likely increase the cost that we already see on a relatively expensive nozzle. The thing that sucks in Hartley Printing is dealing with it on this particular machine is that if it happens mid-print, it generally just makes a mess. Now, I think somehow the Prusa caught this because it did stop. But what will end up happening is that it will just end up forcing filament right out of the machine. My assumption is that it thermally ran away and it got angry, but we can definitely see that the screen itself is a little bit angry. What can be done here? I, I don't know. This happens often enough that I wish we had a solution, but it's seldom enough that it's like, this has to be fixed. In theory, you can heat everything back up and push it back in. And in theory, stake it in yourself, right? By just getting a center punch and just punching where it all comes together and that should keep it from coming apart. We have not tried this. We don't know if it works in practice, but in theory, it should work. Will it? I don't know. This can suck when you are running a print farm, which he is. He runs a print farm where he makes inserts for the Milwaukee Packout. And when you are reliant on machines to do this work and do it reliably every single time, this can be a, a, a major, major letdown. This is where having machines that are internet connected can be valuable. Like the bamboo can notice that its heat bed is melted. The Persia can likely tell you that something is wrong here as well. But I guess we should also say you should never run your printers unattended. Right? Right? You would never leave your printer unattended. Right? I didn't think so. Next up from the Polar Filament Discord, we got Matt Weber. I hope I'm saying that right. Could be Weber, but I think it's Weber. Who has been having a fun time with Sunlu's Matt High Speed PETG. Where instead of the layer shifting, the whole damn build plate shifted. Big bonus points for Bamboo on not losing steps in this. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, yeah, a, a, a corner lifted. Let's just push the whole plate out of the way. Credit where it's due, that's pretty damn good. So Matt and I have actually had the same issue recently. I did not have it like this, but I found out the hard way that Sunlu makes two different types of PETG. And they're not all that easy to determine when you're buying them from Amazon. One, they have labeled as matte PETG, and it's way lower toward the bottom of the type of material and things. It, it's not like in the first line of the title. Then the other one is the normal PETG, the good stuff. The matte PETG, for some reason, does not print well. Well, it, it's it's because it, there's fillers. There's fillers in it that make it matte. This is why it doesn't print well. We know that's why it doesn't print well. So here's the stuff that I ordered. And you can see high speed, sure, you know, that, that makes sense. 
Matt. That was the problem. And when you search for Sunlu refill spools, this is what you find. This is actually what I wanted. These ones. This is just the regular PETG. They are so close to each other that the average person could easily make the mistake. And the price is even so close the average person can make the mistake. He dealt with the same BS. I said, let me guess. You thought it was regular PETG. He's like, I did. I'm like, it's not. It's a blend. Thankfully, all's well that ends well. Put the plate back, change the material, off to printing again. No big deal. If you do want to check out what Matt does, we'll link to his website down below. Does this happen to you? Have you done this before? And manufacturers, please make it more clear. What is the high speed stuff? What isn't the high speed stuff? Those of us out there that will buy hundreds of kilos a month of your materials, we want to be certain that we are buying good stuff. Because if we can't, then we're not going to buy it. As much as I would love to support my USA manufacturers, sometimes you end up with demand that overruns the actual supply that exists. But that's why as a business, we have multiple different vendors that we get to pull from. Sometimes Uncle Bezos can be useful much to the dismay of not wanting to use it. What's your most used color? Uh, we find that, well, white, black, gray, red, and I think blue is after that. In that order, those are the most common colors asked for here at 3D Muskers. I'd like to know from you all, how much inventory do you hold and what are the most popular colors that you are printing in? And a huge thank you goes out to all of our Patreon and channel member supporters whose names are listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. And hey, you guys just got access to almost three hours of 360 footage from Shanghai. So if that's your kind of thing and you want to see a Making Sawsome podcast and Jacob and I just try food. I think you'll enjoy that kind of thing. It's a fun one. But if you do want to support the efforts that we do here, you can do so by joining for as little as $1 a month. It helps make videos like these possible and deep dives where I have a very, very, very large order of electronics that we are going to be placing. To try to determine more about these A1 fire issues. But whew, huge thank you to those members because uh, yeah, yeah, I had to dip into the Patreon funds for that one. But that's all we have for you all today. Don't forget to like and subscribe but stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one.